So this lecture is part of an online commutative algebra course and will be about functions on the spectrum of a ring. So um, let's start by looking at an example. Suppose we look at the ring of continuous functions on a topological space X. So X is compact, Hausdorff, and this just means the continue real valued functions on X. So the elements of the ring, of the ring R, let's call this ring R, are functions on X. And we saw earlier that X is more or less the spectrum of the ring R. It's really the um, spectrum of maximal ideals of R. Um, and you remember that R had some rather funny looking prime ideals, which we will kind of ignore. Um, and uh, this makes it easy to visualize the ring R because we can just think of the space X and we think of R as being functions on X. And the problem is, can we do something similar for any R? Um, in other words, we want to, um, the, the elements of R should be something to do with functions on the spectrum of R. Um, and well, the first question is, what, what should these functions take values in? Um, so, so let's have a look here. So, so here the functions on X are taking values in the real numbers. Well, what are the real numbers? Well, if you take a maximal ideal of C of X, then the maximal ideal kind of corresponds to a point of x. So this is just functions f with f of x equals zero. And the function f is taking values in the field c of x over m of x. Of course, in this case, the field just happens to be isomorphic to the reals. Um, and we can do this for, um, we can do something similar to this for any ring R. So, so, so now, now let's take R to be any ring. Then for each prime ideal in the spectrum of R, we get, well, we don't get a field, we get an integral domain, R over P. Um, and we can think of, um, an element f and r as a function from the spectrum of r to, well, what we're doing is for each point of the spectrum of r, it's taking values in um, the, the integral domain r over p at each point. Um, so let's see uh, what happens. Um, so, for example, suppose we take R to be the ring of polynomials over the complex numbers, and then the maximal ideals are just of the form X minus alpha. So this sort of corresponds to the complex number alpha in some sense. And if we've got some function in, in R, for example, we might take F of X equals X squared. Um, then we can look at the spectrum of C of X, and the spectrum of C of X is more or less the complex line. So there's the ideal X, which kind of corresponds to the point zero, and the ideal X minus one corresponds to the point one, and X minus pi corresponds to the point pi, and so on. And then for each of these points, we've got a fiber, um, which is C of X, modulo whatever the ideal of that point is. And all these quotients have to be isomorphic to the complex numbers. Well, there's one slight exception because we've also got the ideal zero and here we just get C of X rather than C of X over C. So if we think of um, a function F of X as such as X squared, then um, here it takes the value zero and here it takes the value one 
and here it takes the value pi and so on. So this is really just a rather complicated roundabout way of saying we're drawing the graph of the function f. Um, so that sort of works, except there's something funny going on at the generic point because this is no longer the complex numbers. Uh, but we'll put that problem aside for the moment. Um, and uh, let's, let's just take a look at what happens when r is the integer z. Well, in the previous example, all these fields corresponding to the maximal ideals were all isomorphic to the complex numbers. So we just had a function from the spectrum to the complex numbers. If we look at z, things are a little bit more complicated because now we've got the prime ideals 2, 3, 5, and so on. And if we look at the corresponding rings, z over 2, this now has 2.0 and 1, whereas z over 3 now has 3 points, 0, 1, 2, and z over 5 is 5.01234. So this is the integers mod 5. And if we look at a typical element f in z, we, we want to think of this as being a function. So let's suppose f is 8, say. And now I'm going to think of 8 as being a function from the spectrum of z to finite fields. So its value at 2 is going to be 0, because 8 mod 2 is 0. And its value at 3, well, 8 mod 3 is 2, and 8 mod 5 is 3. So, so we can think of 8 as being a function with a graph that looks like this. So it's a bit of a funny graph because um, it's not a graph from the spectrum of z to a fixed space. It's a graph from the spectrum of z to a varying space. And again, at the prime zero, it's not quite clear what's going on. I mean, we could take the quotient by zero and then we would just get z. And if we want to make this into a field, we could take q. So we would have a q up here and it would kind of go through the point eight at q. So anyway, we can sort of try and picture functions of rings as being elements of rings as being functions from the spectrum of a ring to some funny varying field. Well, we don't only have a problem with this generic point here, but there's also another problem. Um, so we've got a map from R to functions. And we can ask, is this injective? Because um, if we want to represent elements of R as functions, then a non-zero element of R should at minimum correspond to a function that isn't zero everywhere. Well, when is, when is the function corresponding to an element of F of R injective? So suppose F goes to, so when is it zero? Suppose F goes to zero in all the fields um, R over P, oh, well, I guess this is an integral domain. So take the field R over P and um, turn it into a, its field of quotients. Well, um, F maps to zero in R over P is equivalent to saying that F is in the prime ideal P. So F maps to zero in all these integral domains R over P means that F is in the intersection of all prime ideals. So what is the intersection of all prime ideals? Well, for the integers, the intersection is just zero, so that's okay. But sometimes there are elements in the intersection of all prime ideals. For example, if A squared is naught, this implies A is in all primes because if a times a is in a prime, then a or a is in that prime. Similarly, if a to the n equals naught for some n greater than or equal to um, one, this implies a is in all primes. So we see the nil radical of the ring, which is the radical of zero, which is just the set of a such that a to the n equals naught for some n, is contained in the intersection of all primes. So 
Um, if R has a non-zero nil radical, then we can't represent those elements as functions. Um, we can ask, uh, is there anything else in the intersection of all primes? And the answer is no. In fact, the nil radical equals the intersection of all primes. To see this, we remember we had this, this useful lemma last time, which said that if we had a multiplicative subset disjoint from an ideal, it means we can find a prime with P contain the ideal I and P disjoint from the multiplicative subset S. So suppose A is not in uh, the nil radical of zero. Then we take the multiplicative subset to be one A, A squared, A to the N and so on. And we take the ideal I to be zero. And we notice that S intersection I is empty because no power of A is zero. So we can find some prime P with P contains I, which is a vacuous condition, and P intersection S is, is empty. So um, no power, so, so, so A is not in this prime ideal P, so A is not in the intersection of all primes. Um, Anyway, uh, we certainly get rings turning up in algebraic geometry and number theory that, that have nil potent elements. So we need to know how do we represent these as functions? Well, we can do this. Um, we consider F uh, in R is, is a function from the spectrum of R to the local rings are P instead of R modulo P. So we're using localization rather than the quotient. So you remember this is, we, we get this from R by inverting all elements not in P. So when does F have image zero in R? localized at P. Well, this happens when Fs equals naught for some S not in P. So this was the condition for a number to be zero in a localization. It must be killed by something um, in the multiplicative set, which are exactly the things not in P. Um, so suppose F has image naught in all the local rings are P for all primes P in the spectrum of R. This means F is killed by some SP not in P for any prime P. And now let's look at the annihilator of F, which is the set of x such that f of x equals zero. So we see this is an ideal. And we also see that the annihilator of f is not contained in p for any prime p. Um, well, in particular, it's not contained in any maximal ideals. So the annihilator of f must be the whole ring r so contains one. So one times f equals zero, which I think you can see implies that f equals zero. So um, if instead of looking at the quotient, fit, fit, the quotient integral domains of R, we look at the localizations, then we can get something which catches the nil potent elements of R. Um, so, so we think of R as a function um, with domain, so we think of an element f of R as a function with domain, the spectrum of R, and at um, um, any element P in the spectrum of R, it takes values in the local ring f of P. 
Um, so if the ring has no nil potents, then instead of this local ring f of p, we can, we, we can look at the integral domain r of p modulo p, uh, which is an integral domain, or we can take its quotient field and simplify things. But in general, we, we have to use this local ring. Um, well, local rings aren't quite as easy as fields to deal with, but they're still a lot easier than general rings. So, so we sort of simplified the ring. Instead of thinking of a function as being an element of an orbit, instead of thinking of f as being an element of an arbitrary ring, we can think of it as being a function taking values in local rings. And we can study each of these local rings separately and hopefully obtain information about the ring from that. Um, so um, there's another um, property of C of the continuous functions on a compact Hausdorff space we should look at. Suppose that U is open and contained in X. Then we can look at um, O of U, which is the continuous functions on U. Um, this uh, O is a sort of calligraphic letter O, um, which is usually used in sheaf theory. We're, we're about to construct a sheaf associated to any ring. And we're first going to look at this in order to get motivation for this. Um, and so what properties does O of U have? Um, so properties, well, first of all, if U is contained in V, then for any continuous function on V, there's a sort of restriction map to O of U. Um, uh, second property is a sort of pre-sheaf, called a pre-sheaf property. Um, suppose U is covered by open sets u1, u2, and so on, possibly infinite number of them. Then if a function on u is naught on all the ui, then f must be the zero function on the whole of u. That's just saying if a function is zero at every every element of an open cover, then it's zero on the whole set. And that's kind of obvious for functions. And the third property is the sheaf property. So again, we assume U is the union of UI. So let's just assume it's the union of U1, U2, and U3. Now suppose we've got functions fi on the open set ui. So f is a function on ui. And suppose that fi and fj have the same image in O of ui intersection uj. So we can think of that meaning that the function on u1 and the function on u2 agree on the intersection of u1 and u2. Then we can find f a function on u with restrictions fi on um, in O of ui. So this is saying we can define a function locally on an open cover by defining it on each open set. And as long as um, the functions we specify in these open sets are compatible, this defines a function on the whole set U. So for continuous functions on a topological space, the sheaf property and the pre-sheaf property are obvious. Well, what we want to do is define analogs of these for a ring. So given a ring R, ring R with the spectrum, um, spectrum of R, we want to define rings O of U for U open in 
spectrum of R behaving like this. What do we mean by behaving like this? It means as if O of U is the nice functions on the open set U. And it's uh, not quite obvious how to do this because you remember functions on the spectrum of R are a little bit funny that, that, that the, um, the space they're taking values in keeps changing whenever you change a point of R. So it's not entirely clear what you mean by a nice function on an open set U. Well, we will just look at, at open sets of the form UFI. So you remember this is the set of primes such that FI is not in the prime P. And you can ask, what about other open sets? And what we do with other open sets is we ignore them. It turns out that 99% of the time, the only open subsets of the spectrum of R you're interested in are these special open sets, which are sort of the places where some function is non-zero, informally speaking. And um, the other open sets are not too difficult to deal with, but they're basically just an irrelevant complication. So what should O of u of f b. Well, let's sort of draw a picture of what's going on. So here we've got the spectrum of R, um, which we think of as being some sort of space. And we've got some sort of function fi. And the function fi might sort of vanish at the spectrum of R. So this is the zeros of f, by which we mean primes p such that f is contained in the prime p. So if we're thinking of f as being a function, these would be the, um, if we're thinking of f as being a function to fields, these would be where the function vanishes. So, so the saying this is the zeros of f shouldn't be taken too seriously. And u of f is the complement of this. So we think of the zeros of f as being some sort of co-dimension one space of the spectrum of R, and the open set U of f is the complement of this, this hypersurface. And we want to know what are the nice functions on U of f. Well, what nice functions can we think of? Well, first of all, the elements of the ring R ought to be nice functions on this. And secondly, how about 1 over F? Because F is non-zero on U of F, so we ought to be able to invert it. So this suggests we just define the nice functions, the nice functions O of U of F, to be R together with the inverse of f. So this is the, the localization of the ring R. Um, so what we have done is we have defined um, a, a, what is called a sheaf We have defined a sheaf of rings on the spectrum of R. And what this sheaf of ring consists of is a map taking each open set U of Fi to the localization R with Fi inverted. So this is a map from nice open sets of the spectrum of R to rings. And now we want this to behave like Um, the map taking an open set of X to 
continuous functions on X. Um, and as we pointed out, the, the properties of this map were the restriction property and the pre-sheaf property and the sheaf property. So what we're going to do next lecture is to check that this way of assigning rings to open sets does indeed behave as if um, uh, 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 as if this assignment was just taking the nice functions on an open set. And this will allow us to think of a ring um, as being much closer to functions on the spectrum of the ring.